So Gary, 2012 is coming to an end, and um, I'd love to hear kind of where, where we are in terms of the state of the economy, where we are in this deleveraging cycle. We're about halfway through the deleveraging. It started in 2008, and normally after a major financial crisis, these periods last about 10 years. Now, what do we mean by, by deleveraging? We mean that U.S. consumers and also the financial sector globally are basically reducing their debt, increasing their saving to, uh, to uh, pay down debt and rebuild assets. Financial institutions are basically selling off a lot of activities that were highly profitable, things like proprietary trading, derivatives uh, origination and trading, off-balance sheet activities, uh, they're really being pushed back by regulators and by their own embarrassment to, to spread lending, taking deposits and, and lending out, and that's a much less profitable exercise. Uh, consumers in this country build up huge debt. You saw mortgage down payments go from 20% to 5 to 10 to 0, even, even negative. Well, now the standards have tightened up. People have learned that house prices can and do fall. Uh, there's a, there's a, they're, they're trying to repay their, their debts. And this process simply takes a lot of time. And during that, during that period, uh, saving rate is going up, business activity is slower. Our forecast of 2% annual real GDP growth over this decade of deleveraging so far is about on track, and I think it will continue to be. Are there any new realities that investors need to kind of face up to in the coming year that they should be prepared for? Well, I think they should be prepared for a recession here and indeed on a world basis because when growth is so slow, when you have growth below 2%, then it doesn't take much of a hiccup to put you into negative territory and that means recession. If growth were rolling along at 4%, one percentage point up or down would make a lot of difference. But when you're, when you're less than 2%, it, it does make a difference. And of course, that has the risk that the things will, will accumulate on the, on the downside. But we've had a very erratic pattern of, of consumer spending in this country, for example. I mean, in the spring, it looked like people were retrenching. They had three, three consecutive months of declining retail sales. And in 27 of 29 instances, instances where that has occurred since the data started in 1947, the economy's be, been either in or within six months of a recession. Well, is that going to happen this time? Consumer spending picked up. Now it looks like it's, it's, it's falling off a bit. Um, I think that the risk is on the downside, and, and people should be prepared for a weaker economy, and that means, uh, that means uh, probably weaker stocks, but stronger treasuries, weaker commodities, and because this is global, a, a stronger dollar. So you, you just mentioned stocks, so investors should be prepared for potentially a, a weak stock market or even a decline, declining market, correct? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, very much so. I mean. Uh, I, I think there are, three, there are three factors that are affecting stocks. They have worked on the upside. They're probably going to work on the downside. One is revenue growth, the top line. If you've got a global slowdown or recession, there isn't much revenue growth. There's probably revenue contraction. The second thing is profit margins. American business back in 2009, 2010, did a bang-up job of cutting costs. They couldn't raise prices. Uh, they didn't get much volume increase. So the route to profits improvement, and this pushed up margins to record levels, was by cutting costs. And of course, the flip side of that is they weren't paying out labor income, so people didn't have the money to buy the goods and services that they were involved in producing. But that's the other side of it. But, but I don't think those margin improvement, I don't think that's going to continue. Uh, recently, the, the productivity growth has not been there as strong as, as earlier, whether they've scraped the bottom of the barrel, whether they picked a low-hanging fruit, they have to wait for more to ripen remains to be seen. But margins, I think, are going to be under pressure. And the third thing is a strong dollar, and that means currency translation losses. In other words, foreign earnings, export earnings, and foreign currencies translate into fewer dollars. So, Gary, what about housing? Are there any new realities? Uh, there's a little hype going on in housing right now. What should investors focus on there? There's a lot of enthusiasm right now in housing. Some of the statistics look better, but they did in 2010 when the new homeowner tax credit came in, a blip in house prices. But then that wore off and they went back down and people who bought houses for a quick clip ended up being landlords. They, could, they couldn't sell them. They would lose money if they did. Uh, the problem right now, I, I think, is inventories. These inventories are not listed uh, for sale, but they're, they're hidden. They're, they're, I think they'll come out of the woodwork. These are vacant houses that have been foreclosed, not yet sold. These are houses that people listed earlier. They couldn't stand the bids. They pulled them off the market. They're vacant. They still want to sell them. This category has increased over a million houses in the last four years, 
and the total excess inventories over and above normal working levels when you add this in is about a million nine. That's a tremendous excess when right now we're building about 800,000 houses a year. So the excess inventory I think is a problem and, and, the, and it'll, it'll, uh, excess inventories are the mortal enemy of prices and we'll probably have downward pressure. From here it would take 21% decline in prices to take them back to the long-term trend which is very well established from 1890 on, well over a century.